This week, I'm reviewing The Witch's Heart by Genevieve Gornichek. It's a retelling of Norse mythology from the viewpoint of a witch, exiled by the Norse gods. I'll try not to spoil the ending. If you can really spoil mythology, you've kind of had thousands of years to catch up, but I want you to enjoy Genevieve's story. I'm not an expert here. Latin and Greek mythology is much more of my background, but I can recognize someone who really knows their subject material. Let's get into it. A quick plot summary first. Again, I won't get into the back half of the story, but I think it's helpful to get some insight about what the story is about. This witch who's been exiled is named Anger Boda. The witch Anger Boda has been exiled by Odin because she refuses to reveal some of her secrets about prophecy. The Aesir has stabbed her to death three times, rip out her heart, and light her on fire. She survives these negotiation tactics and goes into exile. That's page one. Anger Boda spends her exile numb to the world around her, in living in listlessly in a cave. One day, a man shows up with her heart that had been ripped out of her and offers it back. She reinstalls her heart and is made whole again, except for her mental and physical scars. The stranger promises that he will never make a promise to her that he cannot break. Despite these clever words, she is charmed and definitely thankful for the return of her heart. A charming Norse man with a way with words. It's gotta be Loki, right? Loki pops in and out of her life. They build a relationship together, but he's often frolicking with the other gods up in Asgard. This cycle of his popping in and out repeats many times over the thousands of years they build a relationship together. Time is relative to a god. During one of his disappearances, a huntress named Scotty shows up in the woods. Anger Boda and Scotty build also a great rapport. Scotty makes a deal. If Anger Boda makes potions and they work together, they can turn the cave house into a cave home. They build a nice harmony together. They grow a garden, they add a door to the cave entrance, they stock up on the food supplies for the coming winter. It's a nice scene. Whenever Loki visits again, he's always bringing his antics back into her life. He's birthing an eight-legged horse. He's dressed as a woman because he had been tricking some giants with Thor. All of the different classic set pieces. During these thousands of years, Anger Boda and Loki get married, and they have three children, Hel, Fenrir, and Jormungand. For the uninitiated to Norse mythology, uh, these children bring some baggage. Yeah, a small thing, really. You know, just there's a prophecy about the coming of Ragnarok at their hands, and which spells out the destruction of gods. Odin feels compelled to get involved because Anger Boda's children pose such a threat. This makes Anger Boda unhappy, this makes Loki unhappy. This ends up going where everyone is unhappy. At the very end of the story, there is a turn where the world has changed as we know it, but there's a potential for hope and continuation of Anger Boda's legacy. Moving into discussion about the Norse mythology, I learned a lot from it. I took away different pieces and I want to go into now. Anger Boda as a character is really an amalgamation of multiple female characters in Norse mythology. She is first introduced as Gulfig, who is a giant witch, uh, giant being a name of a people, not a descriptor of size. Um, Gulfig is a witch who has been killed by Odin by, or by the Aesir three times, stabbed in the heart, lit on fire. That's her introduction. After her resurrection, Anger Boda represents Anger Boda, the mythological wife of Loki and the mother of the three uh, monsters, Hel, Fenrir, and Jormungand. She also presents herself as Hyde. Hyde is the uh, Dr. Jekyll Mr. Hyde. She is the good version of Golfig. Uh, she's a mythical, mystical witch who travels around and is known for healing and helping people. Golvig is known as the evil uh, woman who has to be cast out by Odin. So again, Dr. Jekyll, Mr. Hyde. Anger Boda also presents as a vulva, a seeress, a, someone who can see prophecies using her magic of Sade. One thing I really liked about the uses of North mythology and the intertwining that Genevieve does is that she uses mythological stories as a catapult to a rising action. To detail that further, there is a story of Thor going on a fishing trip to fight Jormagand, 
who is the Midgard serpent who lives in the sea and a child of Anger Boda. Thor fights Jormagon, who is a monster, the brutish, giant, evil threat to civilization. However, this story is told in, in The Witch's Heart to a, an audience of giants. And I really like that retelling approach because it allows the camera to pan around a room where giants are listening to one of their kin being defeated, not killed in this case, but defeated by Thor. And you can gauge their reaction and see a rising anger that later leads to uh, later actions that explains how Ragnarok comes around. And I really like that because that's a twist on this common approach that you would have where Thor defeating a monster, Thor must be a good guy in this case. He's the hero of the story. Well, not here. The giants are angry to hear that Thor has won. One item really caught my eye, and that is the magic Anger Boda uses, and it is called Sade. Sade is a Norse magic. It's dealing with prophecies, dealing with healing, dealing with crops. It's known as a womanly magic. The reason Sade caught my eye is because it brought me to somewhere near and dear to my heart. Wheel of Time. Robert Jordan pops up all the time when you read through mythology. I guess it's the other way around. Sounds like Sadar. Sadar is the channeling magic used by women in the Wheel of Time. Sade translates to cord or string or rope. It's related to the magical power also used by the Norns, a Norse entity that shape human destiny through the control of the threads of fate. If you look at Saed, Saedar, as a magical power using strands to control fate, that's a lot like Wheel of Time's concept of weaving a pattern that controls destiny. I'll stop there for the Wheel of Time reference. There's a lot more. Moving into some other comparisons of books that are like this one, let's we can start with Norse Mythology by Neil Gaiman. That book is much more of a meat and potatoes telling of Norse mythology. It's easy reading, and it comes chapter by chapter with each new story. It's a good primer for the top hits of Norse mythology. Another obvious comparison to The Witch's Heart is structurally Circe by Madeline Miller. Both focus on rejected goddesses that stand apart from their pantheon. Their secondary status grants them the space to reflect in contrast against the shenanigans of those in the upper echelon. Both stories are a slow burn. They're focused on the inner journey rather than the heroic hack and slash you might get if you made Thor your primary character. I like this narrative approach because it solves one of the main difficulties of telling mythology well, the emotional depth you can reach. Gods are inhuman. Because gods embody certain emotions or certain themes, they've been written countless of times, they've already followed a well-worn path, you don't really get nuance from hearing their story again. But by shifting the lens from these standard heroes to focus on those who stood alongside, it gives us some emotional ground we can now explore. I would say that Madeline Miller's stories are about passion. Circe's story is a thesis about rejecting godhood. The Song of Achilles is about a man rejecting a quiet life and choosing to live and burn out in glory. These characters are both paving their own way to pain, but they're going their own way purposefully. These inner lives are rich ground for retelling and reimagining, because while these characters are known, they can be fleshed out much deeper because they have real passion and motivation because they are the doers of their own story. Their motivations resonate. In comparison to The Witch's Heart, I would say that the plot is happening elsewhere. It's off camera most of the time. For the first, for the entire first half of the story, Anger Boda is living in fear of discovery, in exile, and is entirely passive. Instead of the vivid first-person portraiture you could have had about her isolation, the inner strength gained, it ends up being a third-person story as someone else shows up to her cave to mention what else is going on in Norse goddom, 
and she sits to listen. The second half of the story, after a sharply inciting event, most of her actions are still accomplished by others. Reconnecting to Saeed, Freya shows up out of the blue and reconnects her. Reuniting with her daughter Hel, she can't accomplish it and has to ask Loki to use his wiles and his silver tongue to, to reconcile with her. Admitting her, fi her finally admitting her love for Scotty, Scotty speaks up and acts first. Inger Boda's powerful moments also lacked tension. Freeing Loki from chains stronger than iron, she breaks them with a snap of her finger. There's no build-up there, there's no tension before the release, so it doesn't really resonate as a powerful moment for her. It's more of a shrug. On the positives, I really like Scotty, the hunter. Her dynamic with Anger Boda was great, and as an ever-protective companion, she was one of the strongest characters to me because she brought her own domain of expertise as a hunter, as a trader. You even see her get elevated to godhood. Her ambitions she brings and her own quest for vengeance for her father's death are already fleshed out while she's also building a relationship with Anger Boda. I must say though, the middle third of Scotty's relationship gets a little repetitive as well. Every time she shows up to see Anger Boda, she complains and says, where's your husband? Uh, you're pregnant again. Where's your strange husband? Why can't I just kick him in the balls? Hey, good to see you again. I see you're pregnant. Where's your husband? I'd like to kick him in the balls. It just kind of got repetitive. And I understand that you wanted to build their relationship that she cared so deeply and, and was protective of Anger Boda. I just felt like it detracted sometimes. Let's move to the pros. I didn't get a very strong sense of place. Anger Boda lived in a cave, but I don't have much recollection of what it felt or looked like. I didn't get a lot of inner dialogue about Anger Boda's thoughts. Did she hate it? Did she love it? She seemed neutral. There weren't many depictions of the cave being comfortable, damp, dark, dry, light, airy. You could use the cave as a metaphor for her mental state. She's cramped. She's comfortable. Um, instead, it was always a passive acceptance of where she was, while other people would show up to talk about what they wanted to talk about. The pros did get more descriptive when she would use magic and see prophecies, but prophecies and disembodied voices and an astral plane are really hard places to describe, and I got lost a few times while using those kind of abstract ideas. I think that's a personal thing. I can't really knock Genevieve's um, authorial voice for me not following these abstract ideas. There were definitely moments or different symbols that were definitely detailed and came across well using the rule of threes. For example, the references to wolves and snakes that showed up in every act of Anger Boda's life. The dialogue sometimes came across informally. Given the plot, the setting, the scope, there would be a tonal shift and it felt pretty jarring when it felt like sometimes the casualness of the gods speaking, they, it felt like they could just go, ooh, yikes, oh brother. It, it just didn't seem to resonate the right way. To give two examples. A brief one is when Anger Boda and Loki are together in the cave and building their relationship. Anger Boda has traded with Scotty successfully and has supplies for the winter and has, you know, a keg of beer available. And she says, hey, I've got some beer. Feel free, drink as much as you want. And Loki replies, you don't have to tell me twice. A main point of the story in Witch's Heart is to show that these gods are petty and fallible and strip away some of the grandeur that they may have by talking about their inner quiet lives and relationships. Anger Boda even says later to Loki, you are never a god to me. But still, pause on that moment. This is Loki, a silver-tongued trickster god, and he's making the, hmm, I like beer comment flippantly like Homer Simpson. I could see Thor guzzling down some beer, but Loki's commentary, it didn't seem right. It's a small detail, I know, 
this one comes with strong spoilers, so I can explain the context and the scope of where we are in the story. Here we go. Anger Boda has been killed. Her kill children have been taken from her. She's resurrected from the dead. She re-unlocks her ability to connect to Sade. She tries to reunite with her daughter and failed. She is now stands in the shadow of a shrine dedicated to her own memory. And Odin, her arch enemy and source of all despair, approaches. Here we go again, Anger Boda thought with an inward sigh. Doesn't that come across kind of weak? The scope is so high and so lofty, and her inner thought is not deep. It feels like a trope. Anger Boda's thoughts are often muddy or weak like this, and her later inner dialogue with a sense of self she has, she gets told, point blank, the strength is inside you all along. And that kind of hurt to read. Again, the tropiness nature of it would come across every chapter or two that really took me away and collapsed the seriousness of those moments. With all that said about the prose, I really like the story. I like these characters, I like the mythology, I really appreciated the work that Genevieve had to do to weave it all together. This plot was familiar, but again, the narrative angle really brought some fresh light into it. My main critique is about agency. Readers like characters who do things. Show me Anger Boda being valuable by making a choice to accomplish something and succeeding. Show me even a quiet scene of Anger Boda in her cave where baby Fenrir is rolling around at her feet and I can feel her breathe and be comfortable and the master of her domain as a choice. I didn't get that agency from her. I would say she wasn't a protagonist. Protagonists move something forward. Everything happened to her. I don't know I'll come back to this story in specific, but I really appreciate it because I can use it as a launching pad towards the pieces that really interested me. It made me want to read more Norse stories. Overall, I would give this book a 3 out of 5. I look forward to seeing what else Genevieve 